did a terrific job closing Black Hat for those of you who were over at the Caesars. Art Money is Assistant Secretary of Defense and CIO of the Department of Defense with responsibility for command, control, communications, and intelligence. That just about takes care of everything. He has an extensive background in industry as an engineer, and he's also been president of a major defense contractor. Uh, next, uh, Dick Schaefer. <laughs> Dick works for Mr. Money. He's the Director of Infrastructure and Information Assurance in DOD. He's been in the information security business for over 25 years, and he is a former U.S. Marine. <laughs> Next, Jim Christie. Jim is a special agent in the computer crime investigation wing of the Air Force Office of Special Investigation. He is detailed to Dick Schaefer, the Defense-Wide Information Assurance Program, who is the Department of Defense representative to the President's Infrastructure Protection Task Force. He was detailed to Senator Sam Nunn in the past as, and the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, and he's Director of Computer Crime for the United States Air Force. Last but not least, Dave Gerald. Dave is the director of FedCERC, or the Federal Computer Incident Response Capability of the General Services Administration, or GSA. This is the way we're going to do it. Each person is going to take a couple of minutes to make a statement, and then we will calmly, respectfully, and with great dignity, question the panelists. <laughs> Mr. Muddy. Thank you. It's, uh, I think, indeed a pleasure to be here. Ah, oh, come on, lighten up out there. I've been asked so far uh, today, at least a dozen times, why, uh, why did uh, I want to come here. Uh, to me, this is a, uh, a unique opportunity to talk to, uh, to you all, as, as was it uh, last night with the uh, Black Hat uh, affair. My, my job in the uh, Department of Defense is, in fact, to keep uh, what we call information superiority working, make information superiority work or happen. Uh, what does that mean? The, the premise, the vision, the Joint Vision 2010 that General Shalikashvili laid down, who was the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff about three years ago, um, has uh, how America will fight and win future wars. And what that talks about is dominant maneuver and precision engagement and things like that. But wrapped around all that is information superiority. And what does that mean is to ensure an uninterrupted flow of information to the warfighter and deny an enemy or an adversary that same. Uh, it also means an uninterrupted flow in a business sense. So I have two hats. The C3I hat is the warfighter hat. The CIO hat is more the business affairs or the revolution in business affairs hat. And the two need to work in a seamless manner. Uh, the DOD has roughly a $300 billion a year budget, which means about $35 million an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year is flowing somewhere. Electronic commerce is very much important to us. Um, so at one end, we're getting the information that a warfighter needs in a cockpit or in a foxhole or on a Humvee or on a ship. At the same time, uh, paying people, having the uh, contractors paid and so forth. All that needs to work in a seamless flow. That may seem a little bit strange to you, but ordering a spare part from a battle should not need or does not need, cannot be uh, interrupted any longer so that part gets to the right spot and so forth. Same thing with blood supplies. And we've had hackers hack into hospitals and change the polarity of the blood supplies. That might sound like it's fun, um, giggles, shits and giggles, that kind of thing, but it's serious stuff. People now die because they get the wrong blood. 
Uh, some of those people may be your brothers or sisters, your parents or whatever. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to come here to say, yes, it might be uh, viewed as a challenge, it might be viewed as fun to hack in and screw around with some data, but we're affecting uh, the lives of people. Maybe those are your brothers or sisters. So that's one of the things that I wanted to get across. The other thing is, to some degree, is to thank you. Last year, Jim Christie and I think Jeff Hunker asked that you'd lighten up during the Y2K during the millennia turnover. And, and we have essentially uh, very minimal uh, hacker problems into the, uh, into the DOD last uh, year over the uh, turnover of the millennia. That was good news because we were very, very heavily concentrating on terrorists infiltrating uh, the United States. Uh, well known ones coming across uh, Port Angeles uh, from Canada coming into the northeastern part of the United States. So our focus was clearly on what could lead up to not a cyber attack, but a physical attack. So uh, in, the, in that degree, uh, I appreciate your uh, cooperation. My final message, and then we'll go to the Q&A, is in fact, there's a couple of um, new messages I wanted to send. If you really, and obviously some of you are extremely talented, extremely talented and skilled, gifted even, at what you do. If you're thinking about what do you want to do the rest of your life, then maybe we ought to think of this in a slightly different, uh, different manner. And that manner is come to work for us. Come to work with us. I'm serious. There's a couple of great examples. In the Washington Post yesterday, Brian Martin, who I uh, used to who used to attend this conference, is now a security consultant. Uh, there's a great dearth. There's a great need for uh, security folks, for security consultants, for system administrators, for people who understand the innuendos that you all practice. In fact, to protect the country, to protect the military, to protect the country from the standpoint of what's going on. We're no longer under attack in a hacker sense. We had 22,144 attacks last year on DOD. We know that because we have intrusion devices extensively placed now. These were attacks, blatant attacks, and an occasional pain. So we're getting, whatever that works out, seven or eight a day. Some of these are now state-sponsored by other countries or transnational problems, transnational groups coming in and attacking, maybe not just for uh, uh, shits and giggles in that context, but actually to do much more serious damage. So the whole game has changed. Um, a hole in the slowest operating system that caused havoc two years ago isn't going to be as uh, serious today, but having much more subtle attacks, much more sophisticated attacks, and frankly what keeps me up at night are the ones that are out there that we, we haven't even detected. The integrity of the United States, which is the greatest nation in the world, this is a great witness of that. Where else could this kind of a convention be held? Where else could this happen? So at the same time, to preserve your rights, I'm, I support the Constitution of the United States, have been confirmed twice, support the laws of the United States, but at the same time, we think about what are we doing in the future? What are we doing now that will affect our lives in the future? When I invite you to join the government, or the private industry for that matter, but get on the defense side, yes, the government has some offensive capability. We don't talk a lot about that here, but yet it's another weapon system in the quiver that we need to protect ourselves. It doesn't, it isn't used. It is only used with presidential authority as if it was nuclear to release. That's the severity of cyber attacks in how we work those in the United States government. So I invite you to think about what you're doing today that may affect you in the future. If you really enjoy what you're doing, and as I said, a lot of you have talent in that way, then join us. Join us in preventing, educating our people, uh, preventing more serious damage to be done to the country in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. Next up. No. I, I just want to add a couple of words to uh, to, to what Art said, uh, and, and sort of put in perspective the the operational environment in which we uh, we conduct our, our everyday operations. Uh, I, I don't need to tell this group that it's a uh, it's a, it's a globally connected, uh, interdependent environment. 
Um, it's commercially based, it's infrastructure, commercially infrastructure based. And so when you're out there sort of running around the neighborhood, uh, we're your neighbors. And the sophisticated or the serious adversary that, uh, that Art spoke to, and there are a lot of very, very malevolent characters out there. Um, could be nation state, could be uh, transnationals. Uh, our friend uh, Osama bin Laden uh, doesn't necessarily uh, always have to use uh, physical means to, uh, to get his way. But, but we're all out there on the same highway. And, and the more that we interact, the more that we bump into each other, uh, the more we have to understand sort of the rules on the road and, and, and how we play. Because in that environment, we don't know whether it's you or whether it's Osama bin Laden or one of his compatriots that are, uh, are trying to do something uh, malicious against, uh, against the U.S. And there are many, many serious uh, operations in which the U.S. engages um, that we absolutely seriously depend upon that infrastructure in order to conduct that business. And unless it's there, unless it's there when we need it, uh, unless it's there providing the capability that's essential to conducting the operation, whatever it is, we're in trouble. We're all in trouble. And the U.S. close partners and allies could be in trouble. So I, I'd like to sort of foot stomp what, uh, what Art said. Uh, those of you out there who consider yourselves to be really good, um, anybody can download scripts off the internet and, uh, and, and put them into the system and, uh, and fly away, and that, 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 that's pretty easy. But uh, for those of you that are, uh, that are above that, are uh, sort of the best of the best, um, we've got some of the, uh, the most sophisticated toys in the world. Much more sophisticated than what you've got in your basement, I guarantee you. And uh, if you'd like to get access to those toys and become part of a, uh, a very, very elite team, uh, then we, uh, we invite you to, uh, to have a discussion. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean U.S. government. Uh, as Art said, um, there's a lot of contractors that we rely on to, uh, to support us. But I, I can guarantee you there's, uh, there's nobody here with the level of sophistication um, that uh, can be matched within the U.S. government, and there's nobody here that has a, uh, a, a set of toys that's anywhere near as neat as the stuff that we've got. So uh, with that, uh, I, we had uh, hoped that we'd have some, uh, some military recruiters here uh, just to sort of uh, handle, the, handle, handle the onslaught. So uh, just uh, we, we do, back in the corner there. Just in case you're motivated. Stand up, sir. <laughs> So, <laughs> so anybody uh, at, at the conclusion of the conference that wants to uh, wants to sign on, I, I guarantee you we're uh, we're very interested in talking to you. Um, but I'll just qualify that we're we're interested in talking to the best of the best. If you're average, uh, we you know, we we don't really need you. If you're the best of the best, then we're very interested. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who's up? Jim? I'm going to make my statement right here real quick. Uh, first off, I'm going to piggyback off what Mr. Money and, and Dick said. Uh, but before we recruit you, you know, in God we trust all others, we polygraph. So I just want to make that perfectly clear. And I'm just here to trade t-shirts, so, uh, you know, anybody who wants to trade t-shirts with me, you know. <laughs> Okay, Dave. I have a question. How many hackers in the room? No, no, no hands? Oh, come on. Aren't you proud of what you do? I just wanted to... I just... <laughs> yeah, he said close your eyes. I just wanted to emphasize something. Building on what Art Money said a while ago, there are those things that are done for education, for curiosity, and that's good. That's how we learn. 
But those of you who would enter into uh, an event for the purposes of anarchy or causing uh, disruption of services to critical services where life and death and our way of life depend on it, there's no glory in being an asshole. Think about what you're doing and think about the methods that you use for drawing attention to yourself whenever you discover a vulnerability or a weakness in the security posture of the system. There's a right or wrong way to go about it. What I would ask of you is if you discover a weakness in a system, rather than posting it on uh, some chat line or an IRC or sharing it with your buddies, pick up the phone and call me. I'll give you the number. It's toll free. It's toll free. It is 888-282-0870. Call the Federal Computer Incident Response Capability. We will take what you have learned and make a difference. We will put into place protection mechanisms or we will put into place patches where they're needed. We know the government is way behind on this and we know that. And we need help. You're in a position to either help people or to hurt people very seriously. And we would ask that you take a common sense approach of that and do the right thing. Call us when you find something wrong. We'll fix it. What was your home phone? <laughs> I'll give you a number for dial up prayer. How's that? <laughs> if you're good enough, you can find it, right? <laughs> Okay, you've had the challenge. If when he gets home, his answering machine is connected to clublove.com, then he'll know he's got somebody elite out there in the audience worthy of their attention. Okay, ready for questions? Sure, do it. Okay, yes. And to whom is your question addressed? Anybody in particular? Okay. Who would like to take that one? I think your, uh, your let me work on your second point, is well taken. Uh, up till uh, two years ago, system administrators, and I'll speak specifically and totally of the DOD, um, Dave Gerald at the other end's uh, General Service Administration, he's broader in the, in the government context. Within the DOD, system administrators, administrators uh, were very likely to have two or three other jobs and then be a system administrator. I've jokingly said with some, um, with some precision that um, you may, in a, in a post somewhere, post camp base or station somewhere, you may have uh, be the mess officer or the motor pool officer and then be the system administrator. So it was viewed as a as a add-on task and not as a um, full-time job. Consequently, the DOD has, has not, had not trained folks very well, nor had put into a discipline sense uh, when a vulnerability was found that it needed to be patched, corrected within a period of time. Since solar sunrise, that has started to change. We, you, you can, you red team us every day. You all out here, and wherever your uh, other folks might be. Our red team us every day, so every day we're getting more robust. But frankly, it's a pain in the ass. It's a constant um, haranguing uh, when we have more important things to do. I'd rather have my resources devoted on what another state's trying to do to us, another um, solving state that has attacked the United States, uh, has taken gigabytes of material, unclassified open material, but nevertheless has taken it out in a data mining role. I'd rather go after that kind of thing than being uh, seven times a day in a number of places uh, trying to
going to say, well, what the hell is this one doing to us? So we're getting better. We've got a long way to go, but we've, we've upped the game tremendously on training and on full-time jobs for system administrators and the discipline to fix those things when they become uh, obviously need to be fixed. The solar sunrise problem that took us three weeks and so forth, and those of you heard me yesterday, the three weeks was mostly because of the arcane wiretap instructions to go back and figure out who, who the uh, attackers were just took time. So you have an antiquated law that takes physical appearance before a judge with a pile of paper in a, in a dynamic switching sense that could be milliseconds. There's a great mismatch there that's starting to be changed. Until that time, uh, 70 or 80 percent of that attack could have been blunted if the system administrators had put in the patch that was well known in the Solaris operating system. They hadn't done it. So we're getting better. Yes, you can still find holes, but I've, I'll submit it's getting tougher every day for you to get in and screw around like you used to. Uh, frankly, because we've gotten more, more, but more robust, we have a hell of a lot more search centers, we have a lot more uh, training and more discipline in the system. Frankly, we'd rather devote our attention to a nation state that has probably a hell of a lot more a different motive than a malicious attack. Okay, another question? <laughs> yes. didn't say shoot them <laughs> in a physical sense. Let me repeat the question. Uh, the questioner said that yesterday at Black Hat, uh, he, uh, Mr. Muddy spoke of influencing legislation uh, toward the direction of uh, greater punitive measures directed against hackers, up to and including assassination. Is that correct? <laughs> And, and you asked for clarification and amplification, especially the assassination part. Right? I think they might be paraphrased a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> maybe that uh, is an being shot in an electron sense, not a uh, physical sense. So let me get uh, square that away. I don't want some sound bite going out over here that Assistant Secretary of Defense talking about assassination. <laughs> Back to the, so, but we may have a little electron attack uh, going back the other way. The electrons go both ways, you know. Okay, come on, lighten up out there. Uh, let's see, the laws. One of, I'll submit one of the problems we have today, from my perspective, is every attack is first viewed as a law enforcement issue. Every attack is first viewed as a law enforcement issue. Whole other set of prerogatives come into being. Jim Christie can hear, uh, can turn in here. What that means is the protection of the privacy of the citizen. I support that. I support that. I want to be protected as a private citizen as well, but at the same time, if that is also bringing us down, creating havoc, I'll tell you, it was very painful to me when we saw the blood supply in a hospital get corrupted. The polarity of the blood supply, of the blood, was changed. That's, that's, uh, that's well beyond playing around. Um, so we want to change some of this. We have legislation proposed, yet not yet passed, not against the privacy of American citizens, but if an ISP or a certain phone number is used, and it's in a protected entity, meaning it belongs to the United States government as in the Department of Defense or something, it is immediately a national security issue, no longer a law enforcement issue, then the game changes. It's now not a law enforcement issue, it is a national security issue, and then immediately tracing back, hacking back, shooting back, quote unquote, in electronic sense, is within our prerogative. So that's what's uh, so likely to change. There's a great, um, I, we'll get to you, there's a great um, dilemma out there. And the dilemma goes this way, if it's a law enforcement issue, the law enforcement folks will most likely want to continue whatever it is that's going on so they can gather enough evidence to prosecute. From a DOD national security standpoint, we don't want to scroll around and wait for more evidence to be got. We need to terminate whatever that problem is immediately. Do you worry about the problem? 
prosecution. We want to terminate that hemorrhage immediately and get on to something else. So there's a built-in tension between the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, between the FBI and one, some of the units within the DOD. So that's, some of this will clarify that. Immediately, today, it's a law enforcement issue. Not everything is a law enforcement issue any longer. Jim, you want to add anything? Uh, just that uh, today's laws make us, you guys don't have to necessarily play by the rules, but I do. Otherwise, I go to jail, and they'd much rather put me in jail than put you in jail. Trust me. Um, so it's much more difficult for us, and hopefully, uh, with what Mr. Money and others are doing, um, legislation will change and make it a lot easier to go back and identify, get attribution for uh, an attack, and uh, you know, do whatever we need to do, whether it's uh, kill them or whether it's uh, arrest them. Electronically, so this fellow will be <laughs> You ain't kill him, so to speak. This fellow will be here. Okay, yeah. Okay, two questions. The first is, if we do come to you with information, uh, are we protected from prosecution in the act of so doing? And second, what's your stance toward releasing source code for programs like Carnivore uh, and all the other sniffers that you have developed? Now, uh, with regard to the first question, if you're probing a network, if you uh, identify an operating system or version that you know has a known vulnerability in it, and you report that, you haven't done anything wrong. You have not penetrated that system. But once you cross that gray line and you gain unauthorized access to the system, now you've uh, committed a crime. Let, let, me, let me jump on that, too. Uh, let's say you break into some place and, and you discover, because you discovered a vulnerability, don't tell me how you discovered the vulnerability. <laughs> Yeah, and if you don't, and if you don't like that one, then call in in an anonymous sense to CMU, Carnegie Mellon. Pardon? Car call in in an anonymous sense, uh, call in or send in information to a, to a halfway house, if you will, like a Carnegie Mellon, where then that uh, information can get to us, but the source of that information doesn't get to us in that context. We're for, I, I we're for sharing information to prevent vulnerabilities, so we can strip off that in that context. In, in other words, if you're really serious about getting information through, use cutouts yeah. and make sure they pass through several hands to get there, and the information will get to the right hands, you can count on it. I appreciate yeah. anonymous emails also that, uh, w that will give me a clue if something is weak, and I pass it on to the responsible network administrator so they can make it not so weak. Okay, and the second question was about Carnivore's open source code for programs like it. One second. Well, in law enforcement, first off, it's nothing but a sniffer. Okay? You know, and, you know, OSI has the same sniffer. We had it first. We call our sniffing. Okay? <laughs> for, for obvious reason. So, it's, you know, system administrators' sniffers are probably more sophisticated. Ours have all kinds of filters built in because of what we can look at, what we can look at when we get a wiretap authority. So you're gathering, as a system administrator, a whole lot more data with your sniffer than, than the FBI is with Carnivore. It's, it's, it's really filtered down. And we don't share our techniques. I'm not going to show you uh, our electronic surveillance techniques. We, we just do, don't do that because the reason is you guys build countermeasures. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> Have a nice day. Sit down. <laughs> So, whoever caught it kind of or really botched it, that was the problem, calling it kind of right. Uh, question here. Uh, we here in America have become desensitized towards violence. The DOD has identified an alternative to violence, namely secure network attack. Yet we kind of treat it as a dirty little secret. What is being done to shift the paradigm from netting Non -solution, where it might be better to shoot a bit or a bite at somebody rather than a bomb or a bullet. That's one of the reasons we're here. Uh, uh, I, I want to repeat the question, but I want to make sure I understood it. You're saying that 
which desensitized to violence, that the DOD has evolved an alternative to violence, different paradigm, which is to use cyber war, in effect, rather than uh, lead bullets. And you're asking, what can we do to shift the entire paradigm, the way we think about warfare and antagonism and defense, into that mode of operating? In other words, to use non-lethal weapons yeah. wherever we can. Okay. The, um, I think you, uh, you approach this in the right way. The, uh, the president, the uh, Sikhs, the commanders and chiefs of the various regions of the world, as you all know, we have conflicts ongoing. Uh, we're trying to maintain peace in Kosovo and in, uh, in the Balkans, in Bosnia. We have, we're trying to uh, maintain peace and keep Saddam from invading another country in Southwest Asia. Yes, we work, worry and watch North Korea uh, and other countries. The, the, the state of affairs today in the world is, we used to be focused on uh, in the Cold War with a monolithic threat called the Soviet Union. Rightly so, they can annihilate us. They, have a thou they still have a thousand ACBMs and somewhere around 10,000 nuclear weapons. They can still launch. But a, a bizarre concept called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, which is bizarre as hell in my mind. This says if you attack and drop one on you, we're going to attack and drop several on you. That served us well. We have a stability that we don't have today. Osama bin Laden does not worry about being assassinated or having part of his village wiped out. So there is no math, there's no mutually assured destruction there. So we have a, what we call an asymmetric threat. An asymmetric threat, a terrorism attack. The world knows not to take on the United States in a friendly context anymore. Saddam tried that and was wiped out in 100 hours. So the, the, the idea is to come after the United States in a roundabout asymmetric area. Take down two embassies, kill 400 people in two embassies, two American embassies in Africa. Or take out a marine barracks in Lebanon, or whatever. Maybe someday, hopefully not, but maybe someday it could be on the coast, on the continent of the United States that this problem is. So one of the concepts is, is to work more, give the president, give the uh, national command authority more or a broader spectrum of responses. The response today used to be drop an iron bomb on somebody. Then the iron bomb we had a precision guidance package so it could go in the particular window, as you've seen in CNN, a particular window of the building. Well, today we like to have even more broader response, and sometimes that is to take down something in an electronic sense. So a computer network attack is, in fact, coming out of the closet. Last year, on October 1st, we transferred computer network defense to a sink, to a war fighting sink that then has different authorities. That was Space Command. This October, computer network attack will be transferred to Space Command. So at the same command, you'll have defense and you'll have offense uh, very close to each other, and there's logic behind that because some of this may be fratricide to yourself. So yes, it's coming out of the closet. It's been viewed and it will be discussed very broadly because, as you probably know here, some of these techniques and so forth are extremely fragile, and it doesn't take much to counter them. So we don't talk openly with any detail or any precision or any specificity about what we have, but yet we have another, what I'll call another arrow in the quiver of how to respond to the world we live in. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? I think the question is, if we're going to protect ourselves, why do we not do it unilaterally and ubiquitously? Is that correct? Uh, so, so the first question is, are we in fact giving proprietary weaponry or aid and comfort to the Chinese at the same time we're saying to our own citizens, no? I think there's been... Uh, anybody want to... I think there's... <laughs> 
uh, I think there's been a uh, uneven approach to this, uh, much to maybe your uh, your uh, disbelief. There is not a monolithic government in the United States. There's several different factions. People are people. People are doing what they think is right by and large. I think people are well intentioned by and large, um, and their responses are uneven. I think your point here uh, with uh, with it doesn't have to be the Chinese, it can be the Israelis, the French, anybody. Uh, our technology is very much wanted in the rest of the world. What complicates that is a lot of the technology is dual use. If it's dual use, meaning it has some civilian or commercial value or application, as well as a military value or application, it's called dual use. One of those uses may in fact be classified or highly sensitive and so forth. The other issue, other is uh, application is wide open. That makes it very difficult to control or regulate. So that's part of the unevenness. There's also been some lack of discipline and sloppiness and, and uh, relaxation and so forth. Um, the, all of that is, uh, frankly, goes with uh, uh, with the kind of a time cycle. A lot of that's being tightened up now. You listen to some of the scientists at Los Alamos having been polygraphed recently. They didn't like that. Uh, but it was deemed necessary, and that two hard disk with Asimiko design secrets on it were lost. So it's, uh, it's your government trying to respond, trying to stay ahead of the game, but yet uh, some of the things have dual use, dual uh, points of view, and that kind of complicates life. Anybody else want to add anything to that? No? Okay. Over there. Over there. Okay. So we have a question that comes out of ambivalence and anxiety. He said, um, gee, we want to work with you, we love you, we're patriots, uh, but, you, uh, but you just scared the hell out of us. And besides, we have a high priority on consistency and rationality, and we see, as you said, things going from all different sources in so many directions. We're trying to get our, our minds around that and understand what the hell is going on. Uh, what he's really saying is help us here. We're, we're, we're willing to work with you, but help, help us out here, right? Did you say? Right. How can we trust you? Uh, let's see. I have uh, <laughs> I have four grandkids. Some of them were about the 12, 13, 14, um, two kids and so forth. So, I mean, hell, they could be out there in that audience. Um, I'm here to... Uh, um, protect the United States, protect our right, protect your privacy. Um, now, at times we may be on the opposite side of the fence. That's one of the reasons I wanted to come here, and if I scared the hell out of you, then in, in some respect that's good. I thought it was common knowledge that uh, somebody has hacked into hospitals and changed blood types, or the polarity of blood types, and that kind of thing. Uh, if that was news to you, then uh, we need to be uh, more open about some of the dire consequences of some of the quote-unquote uh, fooling around acts and so forth. Back to uh, the other point of the question about transferring information to the Chinese or whatever. Uh, that was started off as a belief that the launch systems of the Chinese, principally a system called the Long March, which is a rocket, was needed to in, in fact launch some U.S. commercial payloads. Consequently, those companies in the U.S. were given the authority through an export control system to talk to the Chinese. Um, some, 
there's uh, different points of view on what happened. Maybe more information was transmitted than, than was desired. But that was not your government in a malicious sense. It was your government in trying to accommodate the, uh, the lack of the launchers in the United States by giving those commercial companies more, more capability. But to me, it, it shows an example of how complicated things have become in the context of dual use again. Dual use for a rocket, meaning to launch a commercial satellite that's seen by the rocket then, once it has the capability to launch a satellite into a particular orbit, i.e. guide it to a particular spot in space, is then, obviously, a better rocket to launch a missile to hit the United States with some precision. So again, back to the dual use. To me, the hardest problem we have today is to sort out um, what we're doing on, on side A and in a commercial sense and then the effect of that on side B. Give me another example, Air aviation. Our whole aviation industry, what Boeing builds and, and it then sends anybody in the world in a 777 now is a very advanced avionics suite. You put that into another airplane, it could be a bomber. So it's those kinds of things that are, are, uh, are troublesome. And it's just the judgment of human beings, okay. like you all, that are trying to uh, sort through that. Well, you bought it up, so what's your, what's behind it? Just one second. We have to interrupt these proceedings for an announcement from Mr. Ross. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just have a quick uh, announcement, and that is we obviously have cameras here filming. Um, Every once in a while, the cameras are going to sweep the audience, and we've told them not to do that anymore until we make this announcement. So, if it's uncomfortable for you, if you see the camera coming your way, duck your head, or leave. But uh, they're going to randomly, every once in a while, sweep the audience, and I just want to let everybody know and be aware of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, did you get your question asked? No, this was on the back of the Right. You You're asking your question again about dual use, and, or you are, and it is presuming that there's a singular focus in government, a singular point of reference from which all decisions are made and come. And you did just address the fact that it's a multifaceted animal. And if it's a heads, commercial right? product, it's very likely to be the Department of Commerce thing that has the export authorities with the Department of State. If it's a military, if it's a viewed to be a military issue, then it'll come to the Department of Defense with the Department of State. Uh, but that's a... Uh, a, somewhat of a random, depending on how the initial request was made. This initial request that we spoke to here was from a commercial standpoint. Well, but sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Can I, can I add something also? Uh, just like in this audience, the government is not created equal. Everybody doesn't know the same things. Uh, I think that's why the Department of Defense is represented here, because we, I think we understand it a little bit better, like you guys do, and, and we kind of wish that other folks in the government would, would understand this also. Uh, it's a matter of education and awareness. Uh, this is really new. So uh, you can't expect everybody, the government's pretty big, um, can't expect everybody to have the same urgencies, priorities, and the same knowledge as everybody else. If uh, also along those same lines, uh, you have the power to make the changes in those areas. You not only have a responsibility, but you have an obligation to challenge your congressman whenever you think they're doing something that doesn't fit. Okay. Not a right, an obligation. So you can make a difference on that. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, enthuses me, uh, I find quite interesting, is that every, uh, you know, every four years you come to an election and everybody's all, all up on electing the president. The president is not all powerful. Very few people can even name their senators, much less know what they stand for. 
become more involved in that arena as well. Elect the people that will do the right things. That's what you do. Did you guys get a chance to review any of the uh, dumbass decisions that are made, like lifting the res restrictions on the uh, sales of supercomputers in China? I mean, this, this is a great move for them. I mean, what do they figure they're going to use them for? Uh, video games? Animation? Okay, he, he asked if you ever review any of your dumbass decisions. <laughs> I think it's kind of the question we've been getting, isn't it? Go ahead. The, uh, the supercomputer is a, a moving target. What was meant to be a supercomputer about five years ago is now sitting in your da on your desktop. So part of that is where is it, uh, where are we going to draw the line and so forth, uh, what they got in the context of, uh, if I'm on the same wavelength you are, uh, recently is uh, probably already um, totally uh, commercialized and available to, available to them uh, with multiple uh, parallel systems. So again, it's a judgment call. My view on exporting stuff goes something like this. We ought to keep, uh, from a national security standpoint, the American industry as strong as anybody else. Therefore, we ought to allow American industry to export anything that any other industry anywhere else in the world can export and not limit it to them. Uh, that would eventually hurt American industry, consequently hurt us from a, a national uh, security standpoint. So that is a very much of a fluid changing tr uh, a threshold every day that number will change. So part of that's wrapped up in this, uh, in this decision. Ultimately, it's, it's a risk management. What's the downside? What's the what's the upside? And you make a you make a call. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they're viewed as a dumbass decision. Well, let's make sure they ship us Windows. <laughs> <laughs> they can neither affirm nor deny the ultimate purpose of Windows. <laughs> I don't care if it's Mint Windows or Linux or Unix or whatever. They all have flaws. Okay. Thank you. you mentioned uh, you were in favor of legislation that would make it uh, national security uh, incidents on uh, any government control. That's why it's being a little extreme for the nature of a lot of these attacks against the And what, what sort of checks and balances are there you know, to ensure that the little guys who may be taking it around or maybe facing the website are going to be, you know, jail for 20 years under, under the guise of national security. Well, I didn't say any government. The question was, it sounded extreme to the questioner that it would be a national security issue uh, any time uh, government computers are hacked. It sounded as if everybody's head was going to be put on a spike in front of the city gate. And uh, that raised some anxiety. And you want to know where, where the measure is and where, where the balance is in, in response to appropriate, in an appropriate way. Right? In response, I didn't say in or every government computer, but there are some uh, protected entities or entities that need to be protected in the context that it's not a uh, law enforcement issue, it's an immediately a uh, national security issue, and then you have a different, uh, different uh, response. So it's not everything, but there are some that, uh, but you also ought to view it from your standpoint. Um, going in and mucking around in, um, in somebody else's uh, area, changing data and so forth, has, uh, could have some very uh, serious uh, consequences. So think about that act as well. Let me, let me add one other thing to that. The, um, you know, we're not the only ones watching what we do. Uh, there are, I, I talked about uh, some, some pretty bad characters, some malevolent actors. Uh, there are folks out there who watch sort of the, the, the calls and, and the response. When, when someone breaks into a government computer, somebody is, is watching, what do we do? How do we respond? What, what, are, the, what are the tactics we use to, uh, to address the penetration? Uh, what do we do to the, to the perpetrators? And, and you can bet that there are big databases around the world that have every incident 
that's ever been publicized within the U.S. in terms of an attack on a U.S. government system, particularly a U.S. DOD system, and what DOD did. And so if you were one of those bad guys and you wanted to do something malicious, wouldn't you make it look like maybe somebody coming in and defacing a website at first and we let that pass because that's just somebody tinkering? Or maybe it was just somebody coming in and, and probing around to see whether or not the, the server was alive, the computer was alive, and we begin to let that go because that becomes sort of commonplace. And, and if you really wanted to launch something, wouldn't you make it look exactly like that? So, so think about all the capabilities, all the events that have occurred over the past, you know, pick your, your, your favorite uh, period in time and say, if I was an adversary and I wanted to do something really, really bad, what sort of aid and comfort would all of that information provide for me in terms of being able to camouflage exactly what I wanted to do? Another dimension of this thing that isn't always uh, isn't always quite thought through in uh, in the way it should. Thank you. Let me say something about law enforcement's role. I think law enforcement has a critical role in national security. Um, it's different what happens domestically and what happens overseas. The intelligence community, the military, we we deal overseas, and our job is to violate individual rights of privacy. Uh, you know, break things and kill people. I mean, that's the job. Domestically is different, and we have the Constitution protects everybody domestically. So I think what we need is legislation that's going to expedite the process that protects everybody's individual rights, but allows us to get that attribution in, in a time frame that, that that's going to be critical. Question back here. In the government's view, are ISPs liable for the actions of their subscribers? <laughs> I, that, that, that's probably a, a, a good question for a, a Department of Justice person, but I, I, I don't see, personal viewers, I, I don't see how we can extend um, to an ISP uh, responsibility for everyone who operates uh, from or, or through that ISP. I guess the, the, the metaphor would be if uh, uh, I don't have locks on my door in my house and someone goes through my house and breaks into Dick's house, should I be liable because they went through my house? Well, if I don't know that the guy went through my house, then I shouldn't be liable, I don't think. But if I saw the guy going through my house all the time and attacking Dick's house, well, maybe then I incur some kind of liability. So I think awareness. Okay, was that a follow-up question? Have you considered not only providing sanctions against, but rewards for people coming forward and helping out? What kind of award? <laughs> what will it be? Wait, 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 wait. Well, you, you make a good point, and uh, I think you have to think a little bit deeper than that. For every event that occurs that has to be responded to, I think the estimate was, what, a million and a half dollars uh, per event? And, and that's just on the surface. That doesn't include a lot of law enforcement time and everything that has to go into it. So uh, the government can't ju can just go down to the, uh, the, uh, uh, to the Mint and print off more money t to provide for these resources. The money has to come from somewhere. That money comes from you. That's your tax dollars. And if we have to divert tax dollars to handling these events, we're taking it away from other programs like Social Security, Medicare, and things that are... <laughs> no, 
I think that was the question. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a finite budget that has to be adhered to. And one of the reasons that we can't protect our systems any better than we have is the resources are going towards those uh, social programs like Social Security and Medicare. Toilet seats. Let's, let's kind of observe proper decorum here. Over here. What was that? Question about proposed legislation. Okay, if you're going to attack back, how do you justify that? And how do you compensate people if you make a mistake? U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens. Well, sir, the analogy I use, you'll see, uh, you'll see restricted areas. Uh, there's some just north of here. They're well posted. If you violate that uh, geographical area, you're likely, and especially if there's a nuclear weapon storage, you're likely to uh, have some harsh consequences. Uh, so I think that uh, also applies in a cyber sense. you understand what you what you said that uh, you're going to proactively attack people all we said was we will then have the ability to track back trace back and if deemed then we can have electronic attack back does it say every time just like uh, if you go to a to a uh, restricted area today sometimes you might be arrested or sometimes you might just be told to turn around and go the other way in other words, it's a dangerous world, right? Uh, somebody else back here? Yes, you've had your hand up long time. Thank you. Um, you are asking to expand the things on the wiretap involved, moving away from a police response to a military response, and what you consider critical infrastructure. Uh, yesterday you mentioned that you're beginning to use the public internet more and more as part of your infrastructure for moving data. At what point, or at what point in the future, if I look at my school or my university, Today, the thought is it stops at our door, if you will. It's at the intranet in the DOD, not the internet, the intranet. Yeah, the, leg the legislation is, uh, is uh, written today to be intra the DOD in, in a uh, protected entity sense. To me, it's no, to me, it's no different than uh, a physical attack on Pearl Harbor. So you have now a physical attack on an electronic uh, database of a hospital, of a military hospital, or of a military database uh, where the airplanes are being deployed to, or whatever. It's in that context. All of this, we're private citizens as well. We're here to protect the private citizen of the United States, but not have the United States go to its knees. There's, so there's a balancing act. And part of that's the reason we wanted to come here. You think through what the consequences of what you might be doing are. That's where I joined Dave Gerald's point of view about you all are, are either of a voting age or about to be. Get involved with the representative parts of your government. Okay, over here. Uh, I'm going to reiterate on what the government said about the Thank you. 
question is what exactly? <laughs> I don't think we, we ever said that, that we don't know how to use them. And, and I think it's been mentioned several times that your federal government, the decision makers within the government, uh, comprise an awful lot of people with an awful lot of pressures, an awful lot of agendas, and, 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 and the decisions from, from each of our perspectives may not always be balanced in the way that we would like them to be balanced. But we, we elect people, we put them in Washington, and, and we have an opportunity to influence the way they think, and we hope that they make decisions in our best interest. Uh, I'll just speak just very briefly to the, to the encryption regulation, where probably everyone in this room would like to see free, uninhibited uh, access to the most strong encryption that the nation has to offer. Well, let me tell you, that makes it extraordinarily difficult for other parts of your government to protect your rights. And so, the decisions that have been made recently... <laughs> how? Well... Be, I think we already had that question. Just, just think if everyone had the ability to, to strongly encrypt every transaction, every activity, both legitimate... That, that, includes, that includes not only the legitimate things you want to do, but also a lot of illegitimate things. But you... Let, let, let there, let there, finish. There, there are a lot of privacy rights which we have that we enjoy, but all of our individual rights and where it becomes more important for the common good. Let us let, let answer the question. All of, us, all, of, all of our rights come as, as a double-edged sword. They're, they're rights and privileges which we all enjoy, but we also have to balance them against the common good. Otherwise, we have total anarchy, which isn't really the way this nation was founded. So some criminal activity then uses that same encryption. That makes it more difficult to do that. Uh